Good evening, Tabernacle Church. Thank you for joining us once again for this online Wednesday evening time of prayer and Bible study. Uh, trust that you have had a good week thus far, at least as, as good as you are able to have. And uh, though we long for the time where we can be together again, we're grateful that uh, we can have this sense of connection with one another as we pray together, as we study God's Word together. So thank you again for tuning in and joining us tonight. would remind you about the resources at the website. We do have a prayer points updated uh, prayer guide for this week, as well as an outline. Tonight I am starting a new series of teaching. It's going to be kind of connected to the teaching on prayer, uh, but it is, a, it is a new series in and of itself, so uh, t- take a look at that if you'd like to print off that outline. You can have it ready uh, as we begin the teaching time in just a few minutes. Uh, but before we take some, uh, do some prayer concerns tonight and pray together, I do want to uh, mention a few items to you. One, uh, many of you are aware, but many may not be, that uh, our Unity Ministry continues during this time uh, offering bags of food. And uh, that is done outside. Folks come up, they pick it up, and, and then they drive on. And, and each time uh, that we have provided these food giveaways, we're running out of food. So uh, we're continuing to try and minister to some of the needs in our community as best as we are able. And, uh, and so that is ongoing. A need, though, that we do have is to restock the food pantry. Uh, so if you could begin collecting uh, non-perishable food items and uh, we'll release a more specific list soon. You'll be able to see that uh, online as well. But for, for now, uh, just bringing in those, those non-perishable kinds of food items so that we can restock that and we can make sure that we are uh, helping people who are in a, in a difficult situation these days. So that's a way for you to be involved in ministry. Uh, I also know that there have been groups that have been organizing uh, online. There's been a Sunday school class to meet. Uh, There have been some other groups uh, that have uh, tried to have at least face-to-face interaction, uh, in particular using a resource called Zoom. If if you've not done so but would like to, I'd encourage that. Sunday school teachers uh, would encourage you, if you've got folks in your class who are capable and are able to do this, uh, it'd be a great way to connect with folks Uh, our other uh, Bible study class leaders, uh, if you'd like to utilize this resource, uh, I would encourage you to take advantage of that, Uh, given the fact that I hope and pray that we are getting closer and closer to being able to meet together again. Uh, But even then, it's going to be different. It's going to be a transition period back into the full functioning of the church. Uh, So this might provide you with an opportunity to touch base Uh, with folks. Uh, And would also just encourage you to continue to be praying for one another, praying through the church directory, uh, continue to send cards and letters. I've heard of a lot of folks who are sending out handwritten cards and letters to people. I know that has been a tremendous blessing. It has been to us as a staff. So thank you very much for your encouragement to us. And I know that would be an encouragement to others. Would remind you about Vacation Bible School uh, coming up July 27th through the 30th. So we've pushed those dates back, originally a June date, uh, but uh, we just want to make sure we could do it well and could do it with certainty. So we went ahead and decided to push it back to the later date. If you've not yet signed up to be a part, I would encourage you to do so. You can contact Jane Ferguson and you can find out more information where help is needed the most. And then once again, want to remind you, we'll be having a worship service online provided to you this Sunday at 1030. So it would encourage you to join us Sunday, 1034 worship. A couple of prayer concerns to mention to you as we pray together. And if you want to take a look at the prayer list uh, as we do so, if you'd be in prayer for Kay Fitzgerald, of course, we've been praying for her for some time uh, as she had to have a leg removed. Uh, unfortunately, and that she's developed another infection in that leg, and so they are unable to fit her for the prosthesis at this point. Uh, and, and so if you could pray for her and pray that infection would clear up so that they can move forward with, with fitting her uh, so that uh, she can get that resource made available to it. I, I know she would appreciate 
your prayers. Continue to pray for Wes Eubanks, uh, son of Jerry and Shirley Eubanks, as he recovers from a motorcycle accident from a few weeks ago. Uh, he's continuing to improve, but uh, that, the, the, that is slow and that there's still uh, needs that he has. So if you continue to pray for Wes, uh, I know that he and his parents would appreciate that. We're grateful that uh, Jerry and Shirley got back safely and actually traveled down there safely and have arrived back uh, and grateful for their ministry to their son. But if you would continue to pray for him. Also, I want to pass along on his behalf how grateful he is to you as a church for praying for him. He is grateful for the cards he's received and the phone calls he's received. So again, thank you, church, for being so faithful, uh, looking for those ways to minister to folks, to be a blessing to others, uh, so again, thank you for your ministry to him. If we would also continue to be in prayer for Ken Darris. This is Gail's husband who uh, had a heart catheterization last week. They found five blockages, uh, one at 100% and four at 85%. So they are meeting with a surgeon, uh, but part of their concern is the timing of when a surgery could happen. And uh, they are considering uh, going to New Jersey in order to, to see this done faster is the possibility. So if you would not only pray for the physical needs, but just pray for wisdom uh, as they meet with doctors and as they decide what path to take, I know they'd appreciate that. We also have been in prayer for their daughter, Cindy, uh, who continues to show improvements. Uh, but let's continue to pray for Cindy Daniels as well. Well, there are other prayer concerns there on that list. I'm certain there are other concerns uh, that you may have. Let's keep praying for the, the situation in our nation, in our world. Let's pray for a quick resolution to it. Uh, let's pray for the health-related needs, uh, folks who are suffering under the virus. Let's pray for those folks who are healthcare workers, doctors, uh, emergency medical professionals uh, who find themselves coming into the most contact uh, with those who have the virus, and so let's pray for their health and pray for their well-being. Let's also continue to pray for our government leaders uh, at every level. Let's pray that they would have wisdom, that they would be able to know the facts as they really are, and to be able to make decisions uh, that are not only uh, ethical in terms of caring for a population, but also wise uh, and knowing how, how to move forward and uh, get back to life again. So let's pray for them. But I would also encourage you, church, I'm sure you've already been doing this, but that you would then be also praying that this time would lead to humility and to repentance and to serious consideration of, of the, the, the manner of life in which people have been living. Let's pray that this would be an opportunity, an open door for the sake of the gospel, for repentance and then faith being placed in Jesus Christ. Let's pray for the church. Uh, pray that we would be faithful and bold and courageous, uh, that we would be willing then to share the lost and dying world what is the desperate need of a Savior. Uh, so though, though this has been a very difficult time, uh, we could certainly see this leading to a great move of God in the hearts of His people. And what we would pray would be in the hearts of the lost that are in our nation. So let's pray along those lines. So as we pray together tonight, uh, you pray and uh, pray what may be on your heart and uh, let's uh, lift our concerns before the Lord. Father God, we bow before you, grateful for your love for us, confident that your grace and your mercy extended to us in Jesus Christ makes us right with you, grants us the righteousness of Christ. It ensures that we have been forgiven of our sin. We thank you, God, that in that we have the assurance of not only fellowship with you now, but forever. We thank you, God, that you did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to pray. And so to you, we trust all of these concerns. Uh, the folks that we have mentioned, the names that are on this prayer list, the burdens that weigh heavy on the hearts of your people, uh, not only the, the issues surrounding the pandemic, but just because 
there is a pandemic doesn't mean that there are not other trials and difficulties and burdens of life. And so, Father, I pray that you would then minister in those hearts and in those minds, that you would not only provide healing, physical healing, to those who are struggling with sickness, but that you would provide strength and patience to those who are enduring the burdens of difficult days. Father, we pray that these days would be an opportunity where we as your people are drawn into greater fellowship and intimacy with you. We pray that these days are an opportunity to evaluate where we are in fellowship with you, that we would commit ourselves to being faithful followers of Jesus Christ. We pray, God, you would use these days to form and fashion us as your people, that when we gather together as, again as a church, that we are prepared to be a faithful representation of the good news of the gospel. And we do pray for the heart of a nation that is far from you. We pray, God, that you by your Spirit would convict men and women, lost people of their sin, that they are dead in their trespasses and sin, that you would convince them of the truth of the gospel, that you would grant them saving faith, that they may come to believe in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected. And Father, we pray as your church, again, we would be faithful to the expectations given to us to be a witness in this dark world. We pray for our time tonight as we study your word, as we think about what it means to be people of your word, that you would grant us understanding, that you would use your word, bring it to bear on our lives, Use it to form and to fashion us into Christ-likeness. Thank you again, Father, for this opportunity to be able to study together. So God, I pray that you would use it to make us a people that glorify you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you want to take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, you'll see there on your outline, we have a new series of messages that we're kicking off tonight entitled, How to Build a Better Bible Habit. Uh, One of the most essential needs that we have in the Christian life is to regularly read, study, apply, and consume The Word of God. I would argue it is is one of God's greatest gifts to His people. The fact that God did not leave us to uh, a means of communication that was merely an an oral history, a a series of stories passed down from generation to generation that can get changed and and, and can shift and uh, can become something different generations later. One of the the great gifts of God is that He moved almost right away. As soon as He had a people large enough to be identified as a nation, God then moved to write down His words. In fact, He did it Himself. Ten Commandments, the Bible describes as being written by God Himself, the first one to engrave His words. Beyond that, God moved and inspired Moses to write the first five books of the Bible. We have God working in the heart of Joshua to record his uh, own record of the people moving into the promised land. We have the various prophets being used by God to record Israel's history, then also to record the important prophetic material given to Israel, in particular during her time's of rebellion, message that not only identifies their sin, but identifies the solution coming in a Messiah who would provide redemption. Then we have the New Testament, where God provides us the the clear and profound story of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, how, how Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We have the letters, which then brings all of that glorious message of the Gospel to bear on various elements of Christian living. Again, I just see this as a tremendous gift from God. 
God has not left His people to go searching around to try and find a message from Him. God does not require us to go into some kind of mystical, uh, transcendental state. God does not require us to do something unusual or something ritualistic. God has moved in the hearts of men to give us a sure and certain word. What a profound provision. What a tremendous work of God's grace. Can you imagine how difficult the Christian life would be if we were without the Word? Quite frankly, I don't think we would have any of it. God's Word comes to us as an essential feature for those who want to live the life of faith. God has given us, again, profound teaching about Himself. Quite frankly, without the Word, what would we know about God? Now, now I, I know there would be many who would then you know, say, well, the, the greatest revelation of God to us is in Jesus Christ. And to be sure, that is true. He is the Word made flesh. But the only reason why we know Jesus is the Word made flesh is because that's a verse in the Bible. Now, my guess is, though, here I am talking to a group of people who are gathered on a, for a Wednesday time of prayer and Bible study. I doubt this is that hard of a sell to most of the folks who may be watching. My guess is most of you are committed to the Bible. You believe the Bible. You know that the Bible is, is, is the, an essential feature for us in living by faith and obedience. Unfortunately, though, I think there are far too many believers who fail to take advantage, though, of this profound gift. Maybe even those who would confess with their mouth that they believe the Bible. I found some of the following stats. You've probably heard some of these before. Not quite one-third of Christians claim to read the Bible regularly. I mean, so right off the bat, we have something of a concern here that somewhere around only 30% of churchgoers, around 30% say that they read their Bible daily. That's a pretty small number. And to add to that on the other side, that about 12% of churchgoers, mind you, 12% claim to read the Bible rarely or never. And yet you combine that with another statistic I found interesting that said 90% of church goers claim to want to please and honor Jesus in all they do. Well, this sets up the problem then, doesn't it? That the vast majority of Christians do confess, at least with their mouth, they do confess that they want to know God better, they want to know Christ better, they want to obey, they want to honor Him in all things that they do, yet a significant majority fail to take advantage of the important means by which we are instructed on what it looks like to honor God. What's even more troubling than that? As I hear in so many evangelical circles these days of people longing for a deeper experience with God, for greater intimacy with God, and what I find that they mean is they want some kind of spiritual, mystical experience. People claim they, they, they want this emotional, again, mystical experience where they feel closer to God. This is, I think, identifying why the church today seems so weak. Because people want to be closer to God. At least they say they do, but they are unwilling to utilize the means God has given them to get there. So, so this sets up our dilemma. Al Mohler puts it well in an article he wrote a couple of years ago called The Scandal of Biblical Illiteracy. You see it there on your notes. He said this, Christians who lack biblical knowledge are the products of churches that marginalize biblical knowledge. Bible teaching now often accounts for only a diminishing fraction of the local congregation's time and attention. 
The move to small group ministry has certainly increased opportunities for fellowship. But many of these groups never get beyond superficial Bible study. Youth ministries are asked to fix problems, provide entertainment, and keep kids busy. How many local church youth programs actually provide substantial Bible knowledge in young people? Even the pulpit has been sidelined in many congregations. Preaching has taken a back seat to other concerns in corporate worship. The centrality of biblical preaching to the formation of disciples is lost, and Christian ignorance leads to Christian indolence and worse. I think Moeller has rightly identified a significant issue in the life of the church. A lack of biblical knowledge, of biblical understanding, has created weakness across the board. In spite of seeming activity, in spite of seeming zeal for spiritual things... What is needed is a call back to the Bible. We need to be people of the book. We need to be a people of the Word. This is a desperate need of our day. And so my intent for the next few weeks, and it might even involve us coming back together again when we do, well, we're going to consider then the issue of the role of the Bible in our day-to-day lives. This, to me, is a natural companion to what we have been talking about already. I spent several weeks talking about prayer, what it looks like to pray, how to, how to follow a model of prayer, uh, providing some biblical content for prayer. Last week, we summed all of that up by, by looking at some practical tips for how you can establish a more consistent time of prayer. Well, this pairs naturally, then, with talking about increased Bible study. Because you put these two things together and you have what tradition, uh, traditionally Christians have called a, a quiet time or a devotional life, that, that it, it is beneficial to Christian growth and Christian living to spend time each day in prayer and in the Word of God. But here's the problem. It's a problem, I think, that is similar to the problem of prayer, that a lot of folks say they pray, or at least say they believe in prayer, and that they want to pray more, and yet they they have these questions. They're, They're sometimes hesitant because they don't really know how to pray, or maybe they they are uncertain what to pray. And so that was my purpose then in that series of messages on prayer, to, to, to not only provide some content to prayer, but also some nuts and bolts to it. So I'm going to do the same thing. Looking at the issue of the Bible. How can we become better students of the Word? How can we make the Bible a more regular part of our day-to-day lives? Again, keeping with the title, how do we build a better Bible habit? Because I think this is this will deal with some of the same issues. A lot of folks say, I want to read the Bible more. I, I, I know I should. And then you sit down to actually do it and you find yourself then struggling. You, you may not understand what you're reading and it may be hard then to concentrate. Maybe you're uncertain about where to start. And then on top of that, you then might be concerned. You, you know there's an entire internet of resources out there. But who can you trust? What sources are good sources that you could go to 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 help you, to help, you know, reading that side by side with the Word, to help give you some understanding of what it is that you're reading? So so this is my intent uh, over the next few weeks, to, to take a closer look at what does it take to build a better Bible habit. How can we make Bible reading a consistent part of our Christian lives. And again, pairing that then with the Bible, talking then about what it looks like to have a daily devotional life. So that's what we're going to be doing in the weeks to come. You'll note there in your outline, I have the outline of where we're going to be going over the next few weeks specifically. So here's kind of my basic thesis statement. The main point I'm going to be teaching in the weeks to come, that we can experience true intimacy with God and growth in Christ-likeness when we develop a better habit of reading, studying, and applying the Bible. 
giving ourselves to this kind of regular engagement, involvement with the Word, will produce in us greater Christ-likeness. So how do we do that? How do we build a better Bible habit? Well, I think there's at least three issues to consider. We build a better Bible habit when we, number one, love the Word of God, when we love it. This is what we're going to take a look at here in just a moment. In other words, when we have a certain passion for it, a certain zeal for it, when we value it, when we taste and see that it is good, that in order to build a better habit, I think we first have to recognize its immense value. We should ask ourselves, do we love the Word of God? That's what we're going to do here in just a moment. We also can build a better habit when we trust the Word of God, when we trust it. So we're going to take some time and unpack some reasons why God's Word is a trustworthy Word. Why is it something that we should love and something that we should value? Why is it of greater value than just all of the other books that have ever been written? Why is it something that requires my intentional time and effort. Now, I I recognize, by the way, some of this material is going to sound familiar. We've talked about some of these ideas, though not necessarily in this order. Some of it is also fairly basic. But I, I find this setting that we're in to be a good time to review these basics, to establish ourselves in these best patterns just to ensure that when we do come back together as a church, we do so in a way that we are better prepared to move forward as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. So, we're going to learn about what it means to trust the Word. And then finally, we build a better habit when we use the Word, when we use the Word of God. So in this final section, uh, this is going to be the, the more practical part of the teaching series. I'll talk about what it looks like to study the Bible, how you can be a better reader of the Bible. Uh, I'll provide you with some resources, uh, both uh, bound resources, books that you can order. I'll talk about study Bibles. I'll talk about Bible dictionaries. I'll talk about commentaries. Uh, and again, internet sources that you can use in order to supplement your Bible reading. Uh, but, but I hope for this time... Uh, to, to make it something very practical, something you'll be able then to sit down the next day and you'll be able to use uh, in order to be more effective at using the Bible in your day-to-day life. We'll even talk about how to apply it. How is it that you take some of these, say, Old Testament stories? How is it that you take a book like Proverbs or maybe some of the minor prophets? How do these kinds of Bible passages that seem so far removed from our day and age and our current contemporary experience, how how do they then speak to us today? So let's take a look then at this first part. We build a better Bible habit when we love the Word of God. Now I think this ties in nicely with what we've been talking about on Sunday morning. We've spent a couple of weeks now talking about what it means to love God, heart, soul, strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. So we've talked about what this means to love God comprehensively and then loving God obediently, that that our love for God should encompass every part of our life. Our love for God should also be obedient. Well, how is it that we obey God? If if I demonstrate my love to, to God by keeping His commandments... How do I know His commandments? Well, I know them by His Word. And if the Word is the means by which God has communicated His expectations, then this Word should be something that I love. I should love the Word of God. I should have a zeal and a passion for it. I should delight in it. This is something that I should should value immensely. I think maybe this should be really kind of instinctual for us to think this. Consider this in another context. Let's suppose you're having a conversation with your spouse, and your spouse starts offering his or her input on something, and you hold up a hand and say, I want to stop you right there. I want you to know I love you dearly. I love you more than I can even put into words. But I absolutely have no concern for what you have to say. 
I value nothing that comes out of your lips. My guess is that's going to lead to a really difficult conversation. If you were to dare to make some kind of comment like that, to say that you love the individual, yet you don't care to hear anything that individual says, chances are the person is going to question whether you really do love them or not. To love God, I think, is to love His Word. We should love what He has communicated to us. So, look with me now, Psalm 119. We're going to read all of verses 97 through 104, though I'm not going to unpack every little bit of this. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I've not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Now, you may recognize the chapter here, Psalm 119. It's the center chapter of the Bible. It is the longest chapter of the Bible. And it is about the Bible. Of course, in its, in its most immediate context, the author has in mind the Old Testament as they had it up to that point, in particular thinking about the first five books of the Bible. Nonetheless, our understanding of how God continued to provide us the fullness of His Word, we can apply this to the entirety of the Bible. And, and you'll see right off the bat, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. And, and how does he express his love for the law of God? It is his meditation all the night. Now, the similar language, by the way, opens up the book of Psalms, where the, where the psalmist in Psalm 1 tells us that, that he, his, his commitment and delight and love for the law is something that he meditates on day and night. It's a consistent source of strength and and, and encouragement, and guidance, and direction. He loves the law of God. Now, put this into perspective. When he says he loves the law, think about some of those books in the Old Testament. The, the books where when you're reading the Bible through in a year, you have trouble getting through. In fact, maybe many of you have tried to read the Bible through in a year, and yet you get to the book of Numbers... And you have 15 chapters of so-and-so begatting so-and-so. And it's giving you all of these tribes and the lineage and these generations after generation. And the psalmist is saying, I love it. How about the book of Leviticus? For many, that can be a challenging book. One, it seems strange and, and all the sacrifices and all the specificity of the laws that are offered, uh, and then, then some of the strange laws that are offered. And yet, the psalmist is saying, I love it. I, I, I want to meditate on it all day long. The psalmist then goes on to reflect on the benefit of this. Why is this something that he loves so much? Because of its impact. Because of what it does. Something we'll talk about more Next time, because it's that which, which, which gives him wisdom and allows him to make wise choices. It keeps him from evil. It is a source of protection for him. God's judgments then are precious to him. Notice again what it says there in, in verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Here's what I find so striking about this. He's not just speaking in, in like just philosophical terms. This is, this is not just some kind of idea of love. This, 
He recognizes this in his soul, that the word of God is to his soul what sweetness is to the taste. This is how much he loves it. It's precious. It is valuable. Then he does something right here at the end of the psalm that's pretty typical of Hebrew poetry. You find it even a lot in Psalm 119 uh, of, uh, of this contrasting use of images. So, so we have a positive statement made about something, some act, some ideal, or some principle, and then eventually following that, there will then be the negative contrast to it. So it kind of helps clarify what it is we are supposed to do and think. So he began the text in verse 97 by saying, I love your law, and then he ends it by saying, I hate every false way. So this really then, then kind of brings up to, to its, its, its greatest height the importance of the Word of God. The Word of God is that which feeds me and guides me. It is also that which helps me identify that which is false. How is it that the psalmist knows every false way? How is it that he knows every false way to the degree that he hates it? because he loves the Word. He loves the Word, and that is reflected in his meditation on it. His love for the Word is reflected in his application of it, his, his intake. He's, he's, he's feasting on the Word of God. He loves God's law, and therefore he is able to identify that which is of no value. And he says, I even hate it. I hate the false way. I think it's imperative that we love the Word of God. Because when we love the Word of God, that means we are going to give ourselves to it with a certain zeal and commitment and passion. We are going to delight ourselves in the Word of God. And then in doing so, we begin to develop the proper taste for the Word, which then enables us to identify every false way, to disdain that which is not good. In a sense, you might even say that the Bible then becomes a type of, of an acquired taste, something that you grow in your desire for as you consume more of it, as you continue to consume and apply and take advantage of that which is true, becomes something that you want all the more and hopefully it would then create a certain kind of dislike for or dissatisfaction with something less. So I'm going to give you an illustration about this, and I'm sorry to do this, to, and I think I've done this a lot, perhaps because we're in quarantine, and so I find myself cooking a lot and eating a lot. So I'm going to give you a food analogy here, but I think you'll identify then this, why, why this kind of language in Psalm 119 is helpful. Maybe I could even pose the scenario like this. Let's say it's, it's the middle of summer. You've planted tomato plants, and they are bursting with ripe fruit. I mean, you can practically smell it before you get to the garden. You can, you can see those beautiful red pieces of fruit hanging from those plants you pick it at just its peak of ripeness and freshness. You take it in, slice it up, do to it what you like, maybe just salt and pepper. It goes really well with mayonnaise and bacon, whatever you may prefer. You bite in to that delicious piece of produce. Now, is that different? than if you go to the grocery store in January and pick a tomato up off the stand, it's like they're not even the same piece of produce. You can hardly even put them in the same league. You should hardly even be able to label those as tomatoes, right? They don't come anywhere near to tasting the same. And is that not true for any number of items? I, I'm thinking of a peach fresh off the tree. I'm thinking of a watermelon fresh out of the patch. I mean, they just don't even compare to the stuff that you end up buying at, say, a grocery store. In, in other words, when you, when you have that which is fresh, when you have that which is, which, is, which is at its peak, it is of a far greater flavor. And what does that do then for the other stuff? 
become dissatisfied with it. How about having some kind of homemade meal versus some kind of frozen food? Or better yet, what about having the real thing over some kind of substitute? You can tell yourself what you like, but turkey bacon is not bacon. It's not the same stuff. And you have the real thing and it's nothing then like the fake. You can tell yourself that Splenda is just as good as sugar, but come on, who believes that? Of course not. Now when you develop a taste for the real thing, not only do you know it's the real thing, but it creates a certain disdain for anything that is less. That is why we should love the Word of God. The Word of God should be that on which we feast. It is the real thing. It, 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 is, it is that in which we should delight in an ultimate sense. And so part of that means we just want to continue to eat and eat and eat of the Word of God. And then at the same time, that then enables us to taste the difference. When something else presents itself, we, we should be less satisfied then. We should disdain that which would be a poor substitute for the real thing. We should love God's Word. We should delight in it. Consider some of the other texts of Scripture that say similar things. In fact, here in Psalm 119, this kind of language of loving God's Word, of delighting God's Word, it shows up two dozen times or more. I'll just give you a few examples. Psalm 119.16 I will delight myself in your statutes. You'll notice in that verse that, that personal responsibility and motivation. Not just that I do delight, but he says, I, I will. I will delight myself in these things. Verse 72 of this very same chapter. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. Verse 127, therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. And then verse 167, my soul keeps your testimonies and I love them exceedingly. So here in verse 97, he said, oh, how I love your law, kind of this emphatic expression. Then we have in 167 that phrase, that adding that word exceedingly, I love them exceedingly. But it's not just here. Consider the, pro- the words of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 15, verse 16. Your words were found and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I'm really struck by that language. The joy and rejoicing of my heart. This is what Jeremiah is saying that the Word of God does to him. Can we not not just have a moment of honest and humble reflection on the condition of our hearts? Sometimes we joy and rejoice in lesser things. I've even had to take some time and think about this verse, even for myself. Somebody who has been in the Word of God as a matter of his job for 21 years, every week. Significant amount of time spent in the Word, and yet it can even happen to me that I I find the Word of God to be the means by which I accomplish my job, but the Word here is telling me it should be the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Again, I, I think this is foundational. I think it's fundamental. I think it's an important principle. If we're going to build a better habit, I think we've got to love the Word. One more verse, and I want us to turn here, and that is 1 Peter chapter 2. Passage of Scripture you may be familiar with. It's, it's a fairly classic statement about how we should long for the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now, previous to that, by the way, Peter had already identified an important theological reality about the Word of God that, that the 
The flesh will pass away, man will pass away, grass withers, flowers will fail, but the Word of God endures forever. So this is kind of then motivating what comes next. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. In other words, laying aside all every false way. Laying aside that which is less, that with which we should be dissatisfied. Laying that all aside as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. That you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. As newborn babes crave, desire, desperately need in order for life, milk. So should we desire the, notice that phrase, the pure milk of the Word of God, the means by which we grow. Just as milk is that which is necessary in order for a baby to grow, so the Word of God is necessary in order for, for us as believers to grow. And here's what I find striking, this imagery about craving it like a newborn baby. How does a newborn baby crave milk? What's it like when a baby is hungry? Is, Is there any indicator... Is there there anything a baby does to let you know that he or she is hungry? In fact, is there any doubt? No. It's it's not like a a baby in 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 a calm and quiet fashion clears his or her throat. I'd like something to eat now, please. Now, what does a new baby do? Screams and yells until he or she gets what she wants. This craving, this desire, it, it, is, it, is, it is passionate, it is, it is zealous, it is intense, it is unquenchable until he or she gets what she needs. To me, that's just such a provocative image about how we should long for the Word of God, how we should love the Word of God, how we should crave the Word of God. Here's my concern, church, that there are a lot of believers in a lot of churches who spend a lot of time crying and screaming for certain things, but very rarely is it crying and screaming for more Bible, more Bible, when in fact that is the means by which God's people grow. I think there are a lot of churches that would be well served if some of their people would rise up screaming and crying for the Word of God that they are not getting. I hope and pray that is not the case here. I hope and pray we are a people who are lovers of the Word, and that you are being fed the Word of God, and that is our commitment. That would even then still be our cry, that we want more Bible, more of the Word of God. So this is our first feature. How do we develop a better Bible habit? We should love the Word of God. So, series of questions there on your notes. And you can spend time reflecting on these either either tonight when this is uh, over. Spend time in the morning. Do I love the Word of God? Following up kind of with the way we asked the question on Sunday morning from last week. If I say I love the Word of God, is there evidence that I love the Word of God? How much time do I spend in it? What other less important and less satisfying things compete for my attention? And perhaps the important final question, am I willing to establish better habits in order to make a better Bible habit? In order to make time for the Bible to be a priority? If I get to that question, I say no. If I say, you know what, no, I've not been much of a reader or studier of the Bible, but quite frankly, I'm not going to rearrange any of my time to do better at it than perhaps I don't love the Word. And if I don't love the Word, then 
Maybe there's an issue in my fellowship with God himself. This this does provide us a means by which we are made faithful and effective believers. We need the Word of God. We need to love the Word of God. And I hope and pray that you love the Word. And if you don't, make that a matter of prayer. Pray that God would give you a taste for the Word so you would be dissatisfied with everything else. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for the time uh, we've been given where we can pray and we can study your word. And Father, we do want to love your word. So we pray that you would uh, expose in us the ways in which we don't, the barriers to loving your word well, the habits we have created that keep us from your word. Give us by your spirit the means by which we could then give ourselves to to consistent reading and studying and applying of your word. Guide us in the rest of our time that we we might uh, find the, the truth of your word beneficial in forming this habit for us. And Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gift of this infallible and inerrant truth. May we give ourselves to it as we grow by it. That's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let me again thank you for being a part of this time of prayer and Bible study tonight. Hope it was beneficial to you. Would invite you to join us once again Sunday morning, uh, online, 1030, as we continue to worship our God together. I hope you have a great rest of the week. God bless.